Whilst the illustrious class had been judged to best fill the Royal Navy's needs in the mid-1930s within the limits of the naval treaties, the Admiralty was growing concerned about the size of their air groups compared to some of the newer carriers under construction elsewhere. In 1938, this had led to the fourth ship of the class, Indomitable, being built to a modified design to expand the size of the air group. Originally, the plan had been to build at least six illustrious class in three pairs, but for the third pair, it was decided that with the collapse of the treaty system, a new design was preferred, even if for the sake of speed of construction, some elements would have to be carried over from the illustrious class as a base design. These two ships would be named Implacable and Indefatigable, and the initial specification called for the retention of the armoured flight deck, but a boost in air group capacity to 54 aircraft, not including any deck parking and an increase in top speed from just over 30 knots to at least 32 and possibly 35 if they could. In the very early design stages, late in 1938, there was a brief attempt to keep displacement down to 23,000 tonnes for cost reasons, but it was made very quickly apparent that this was impossible. To increase overall speed, starting from a baseline of the illustrious class hull, the design was made 26 foot longer, using the same beam, but the previous three-shaft layout still wasn't able to give enough power for 32 knots, and so a fourth shaft was added with the attendant machinery. This of course meant more boilers, which meant a larger funnel, which in turn meant a larger island. The outbreak of World War II meant that the ship's construction, which had been started in March and November of 1939 respectively, was soon paused to allow the men and material to be diverted to the initial wave of war-damaged ships, and to the construction of escorts and other more rapidly finished vessels. This delay led to further changes. The flight deck was made wider, and the anti-aircraft battery, which consisted of eight twin 4.5-inch dual-purpose guns mounted in pairs fore and aft on either side of the ship, was made flush with the flight deck instead of raised. The aircraft lifts were made stronger, and an accelerator, a predecessor to the steam catapult, was installed for the use of overweight aircraft or in low wind conditions. Although deck parking was not standard, outrigger pylons were installed just in case it became necessary. These allowed a tailwheeled aircraft to be stored with only their forward wheels on the flight deck and the tailwheel on the pylon, which meant that a good portion of the fuselage projected over the sea and opened up the deck space. The ships were supposed to have a large upper hangar with a 14 foot height restriction and a lower half length hangar with a 16 foot height restriction. The upper hangar was designed to allow the then new Albacore torpedo bomber to fit in and float planes would have to be stored in the lower hangar, hence the slightly higher height. However, Scrapping the idea of storing float planes, combined with the additional weight caused by increases in armour protection, such as 1.5 inches to 2 inches of armour on the hangar bulkheads, left them with a decision to make. Should the hangars be merged into a single, taller, American-style hangar with some aircraft stored in the ceiling, or should they lower the hangar that was 16 foot high to 14 foot? Unfortunately, the latter view won out at the time. As well as the 3 inch thick flight deck and the heavy 4.5 inch dual purpose guns, anti aircraft firepower was supplemented by 5 octuple and 1 quadruple 40mm pom poms for a total of 44 40mm barrels, with an additional quad pom pom and up to 60 20mm orlicans added during construction. Due to the early wartime delays, the ships weren't launched until the end of 1942 and they only commissioned in spring and summer 1944, which meant their wartime service in Europe was limited to a few operations off of Norway before they were sent to the Pacific, where they proved capable of actually operating 70 to 80 aircraft at a time, albeit with limited fuel and munitions provisions, thanks in part to the substantial increase in air group, which was eating those resources up, but also thanks to the fact that the magazines and the fuel systems had extensive insulation and other protection systems, which meant that they were somewhat lower in volume than they could have been without those systems. Whilst in operation against the Japanese, Indefatigable was hit next to her island by a kamikaze, 
but the armoured flight deck meant that the ship essentially shrugged off the damage, and she was back in action in about 30 minutes. During Pacific operations, the lower hangar was usually used purely as a repair workshop, with an escort carrier assigned to each ship, with a number of aircraft aboard which could then supplement or replace damaged and destroyed aircraft aboard the large carrier. However, as the war ended, that hangar height decision came back to haunt the two ships. Newer, heavier and taller aircraft were coming into service, and outside of the relatively diminutive Sea Vampire and later Sea Venom, most of them just wouldn't fit. As a result, after relatively brief service lives, both ships were decommissioned towards the end of the 1940s, and options for their future were considered. One option was to modernise the ships. This would include rebuilding the hangars into the single and taller and larger one that had been thought of initially. This option would give the Royal Navy two fairly new large fleet carriers capable of operating the latest aircraft. But it would cost a fair bit, and with the Colossus and Majestic class light fleet carriers already ready able to operate such aircraft with their 17 and a half foot hangars and needing fewer men to operate, even if they also had smaller air groups as a result, the Treasury decided instead to use both implacables for training purposes for a short period, whilst they first refitted the smaller HMS Victorious. The complete and utter debacle of that particular botch job is a story for another day, but it meant that by the mid-1950s, Victorious had used up not only the entire budget set aside for her modernisation, but also the budget set aside for the modernisation of the two implacables, and some extra money as well. And so, instead of heading in for their own refits, both ships were listed for disposal and scrapped in 1955 and 1956 respectively. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.